test that Jamisha said, okay, the, the test thing that Jamisha bought to me and said, I want these things um, added in because these are the things that we get the most questions about. I put every single test that we use at Advanced Psychotherapeutics, as well as a few that we don't use that you will see often. Um, the first part of the presentation of what I've set up is to set it up in alphabetical order so that if I sent her the um, PowerPoint so you guys can print that off and then use it as a reference guide later on so that it actually serves as something because I know what it's like in the field when you're trying to figure things out, apples and oranges. Um, we'll go through a few of the testing measures. I might not read every single slide to you guys and I'll make sure that I hit on the ones that she specifically asked about that you see the most. Um, I'll try to go through them quickly. If you have questions as we go, I ask that you would just go ahead and utilize the chat box. I'll make sure I have it, I have it open on the side. I have two screens in my view so that I can kind of watch the conversation building. Um, even if you're shy, you can message me directly. If you're not shy, message the entire group at once because um, I prefer the entire group at once because usually we're all asking the same questions. Um, if I don't have answers, I will get back with you guys because again, I am a licensed professional counselor, so I do therapy. So I, I do the what comes with the evaluation. So it's going to be a little bit different, I think, if some of you attended the one that was done before with Bettina because Bettina is part of the team that actually administered the psychological testing. After they finish their part, I take my part and I get to roll in with treatment interventions. And so I think the different way that I present might be a little bit helpful in the sense that I'm kind of a little bit of one of you guys as well as the clinician at the same time because I don't administer the test and I just have to look at it and understand what it means and use it effectively. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen and bring up the presentation. Um, I talk really fast. <laughs> um, we'll go over five things. I, I'm going to do the introduction next, tell you who I am, primary goals of this, and then we'll get to what's this test later, a little bit later. And then when we get to the point of reading a psychological, I don't know if you guys will need a break or if that'll be a time to ask questions. I can just roll because I practice mental health, so I go hours at a time. So if it gets, if I get too winded, if I'm going too fast, put slow down in the chat. Um, and then, of course, there'll be questions throughout. Um, the reason why I talk fast is because I'm not from here. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Um, we speak very fast the further north you go. <laughs> and Chicago, you go any further north, you're in Canada. So <laughs> that's how that works. Um, I moved to Lynchburg back in at the end of the 90s. Um, I attended college here and then I left and went home and I was going to do my master's online but I found out that the state of Illinois at that time did not accept masters that were completed online so I had to come back <laughs> and do that but in that time um, I realized I really liked it here in comparison and then once I met my husband that was a done deal because his family is from the area um, I've worked with children my entire career. I've also worked with adults because you can't work with children without working with their parents. Um, and I entered into mental health after my um, bachelor's had been completed and I was partially almost done with my master's um, back in 2006. Um, I started off with children with cognitive deficits. So testing was something that I had to make sure I didn't lose capacity for you know how you go to school, you learn something, and then you leave, and then you forget half of it, and you only use the parts that you use. Well, testing was something that I learned in the classroom and took immediately into the workforce and had to understand how those um, numbers and data affected and what it looked like on an everyday um, manner, and it actually helped me um, to become the behavioral cognitive therapist that I am, not being able to divorce myself from statistics, which is what most <laughs> counseling um, perspectives want to do because it's hard. Um, I do speak in pictures a lot, and that's because I primarily a lot of the time I'm working with people on the autism spectrum and other neurodivergent areas. Um, I work with a lot of trauma cases. I also work with educational problems. I spend a lot of time working with foster care clients, um, anxiety, oppositional defiant disorder. Um, there's only a few conditions that I don't exclusively treat, but even those things that I don't exclusively treat, I make sure that I have a good knowledge base of because it's my duty to do the referrals out. Um, and so I love what I do. So let's move on into it. So the goal that I have for you guys today is by the end of this meeting, I hope we have the equipping of being able to look at a psychological and not feel like it's a different language, to be able to understand what parts you can go ahead and ignore, what you need to focus in and pay attention to, 
and how to kind of read them between the lines a little bit. Um, before we go into the testing, the first thing I want to talk about is how psycho psychologicals are both an art form and a scientific basis for how we measure people's behaviors. The art form place comes in first, and this is where you guys also can kind of sometimes help, especially if the testing is requested by you. Um, when you give a summary of what you're looking for, you can't be too wordy. You can tell the why of these are the things that I'm seeing. I don't know what this means. These behaviors are um, baffling to me. It's unusual. That sort of information kind of helps the person that's doing the testing take their skills and know which test to administer. Um, if you look at a psychological and you see where one test is telling you one story and then the next test tells the opposite story, the interpretation of that is the skill set of the art form of the practitioner to understand what that person was trying to get to. Towards the end of this, I'm going to pull up a dummy psychological that has that dynamic in to give a more um, concrete example of that. So you'll be able to see what that looks like. Um, so you'll see a lot of the tests are looking for some repeated aspects. So if a person has, for instance, autism, it should kind of reflect its way into the different measures that are administered, even if that me that measure is not given towards diagnosing autism. It's not just going to go away and come back. So that's something to keep in mind. So what test is this? So when I put these tests in, I put them in alphabetical order. And so I'm going to speak a little bit about how that works so that you know what to expect. And then I'm going to kind of take a note from the crowd, that interactive space of whether or not I should keep going through each test and talking about it, or whether this time would be better used asking specific questions about specific tests. So I'm flexible with this, and I'm just going to flow with it. So here we go. Um, the first test that comes up on the alphabetical list, but it's not on the list that Jamisha gave me. Oh, no, it is. It's the first one. And this is one that you guys see a lot of is the AAPI. Two, the Adult Adolescent Parenting Inventory is the second edition. Um, and I'm just giving a brief example of what that test means because I don't want you to get just stuck in what a test means. I want you to be able to look at the test that you have and when you're reading the data, understand what it's telling you about. So that test is an assessment that examines the attitudes about child rearing for adult and adolescent parents. So if that parent is thrilled up here about being a parent, but it's not coming out in their actions, um, then that's something that gives us another space to work with in comparison to a parent that doesn't seem to have an understanding of what they should be doing as a parent. And they think they're doing a pretty good job, but they really don't have a clue. It, it, those things are, those two issues are approached very differently. And so depending upon the results that we get from those tests, when you read the results, it's like, okay, so what does this mean? We should be looking at how they're performing as a parent based off of where their cognitive skills are falling and their awareness of what they're doing intentionally as a parent versus their ability. And so that's what that assessment teases out. I'm going to move on to the next one, and I'm going to do each of them just this quick, just to give an overview. Because in the end, if you get a copy of the presentation, it will just give you those little bits. And so if you have this alongside a test, because that's the way I prepped this, if I had a psychological and I needed a quick reference guide, this is a quick reference. It's not going to go into so much scientific language that I get lost in the bogs. I just want to know, okay, so this is supposed to measure that. And so you put that hat on, you read the results, and then it should make a little bit better of sense. And then I'll get to the end and show you guys how to read those little charts, because that's where the meat of the matter of the psychological test is. So that's the AAPI. Um, the ADI, ADIR, this was, a, I call it the old school, um, because it's an autism diagnostic interview. One of the things that I'm just noting the really important parts here, it's a diagnostic tools that we use to diagnose autism. Um, it's usually administered by a psychologist, um, and that psychologist is interviewing the parent for content. And I thought of with CASA, you know how you guys are working with a lot of foster care cases. The hard part with this is if they come through our practice and they do an ADRI and they've been removed from their primary custodian and their primary parent is not a part of the psychological processing, we're going to have very limited information. 
So you could be looking at a child and like, this kid is clearly autistic, but it's not always going to show up because it's really contingent on the person that is doing the interview. And so if this foster parent comes into care, the kid comes into care with a foster parent on a Tuesday and testing is set up for Friday, this may not be an effective tool unless that kid is so classically presenting that it's easy to report the pattern of behaviors to support a diagnosis. I don't know if that, what I'm saying is making sense, but I hope so. I'm not getting any head nods. I'm just getting <laughs> faces aflit. Um, so the next one is looking at the ADRI is focuses on the developmental history, the memory of the people closest to them. And a lot of times we often find that with foster care, those people aren't necessarily available or there. Um, so then that test is all is administered by um, advance. The next one is this is the new kid on the block. This is the one that everybody rants and raves about, which is the ADOTS 2, uh, which is a diagnostic observation schedule. Now, with this assessment, um, this is based on the, the observation of that child's behaviors. Um, it can it even goes into adulthood. So their ability to tell a story and interact and share information. Um, we, of course, do still need that developmental history as much as possible. But if we're looking at the restrictive and repetitive play practices, interactions, how the, the tone of voice, there's certain different things that we look for um, within autism and the person that administers this assessment is versed in that. And so we take that information along with the clinical interview and we try to paint a picture and then it's scored out and tells you whether or not they have autism. Um, up here, the moniker at the beginning of each test, I put the letters that are used because I know that oftentimes when you're talking to practitioners, they're like, yeah, we did a WISC, MMPI, Mackie, and did it. And you're like, wait, what? You know, so I wanted to clear that up. And so that's how I alph alphabetized it by because I know that's the language that we practitioners tend to speak and it's Greek. So, and then I gave the long form of what each test was. So the next one we have is the BIRI. Um, We're looking at this is part of developmental testing and anything um, clue word for developmental is usually something that we do automatically administer to a child. That is a quick cheat. Um, do we do, um, administer developmental testing to adults? Yes. If we get a parent that's coming in and they don't test positive for substances, but they look like they have like low cognition or maybe some psychosis going on or something, then they might administer not necessarily the BERI, but something along the developmental lines to see, hey, what's going on up there? Because you got to know where your limits are before you start working with someone. Because if I come and start speaking master's level language and you're not getting it that's not your fault you know i have to figure out where you are um this testing focuses on a person's ability to integrate their visual and motor abilities um and so this will point out whether or not there's something going on between i call it the gas tank and the fuel injection system if there's a disconnect there um, and it'll help us understand if there's maybe even some psychosis or something on board now when i say psychological testing is an art form and a science once someone administers something like this, depending on the results, they may say, hey, come back here for a second. We want to administer this one over here, which is a cousin to that test and see if it picks up on something. Like if I get an ADOS that comes up negative, but they weren't communicating too good, I may want to do an ADRI where I interview the parent to say, tell me more about that or vice versa even. Um, so Sometimes when the people go into testing, even though we're not looking for the full scale IQ or FSIQ to change, and that is where you hit, and we'll get to that a little bit later too, it, we're still looking in between what can we work on? What can we make better? What can we augment? Where are we stuck? Like if a person doesn't have capacity to do anything above a sixth grade level, when they hit that space, they are maxed out. We can't push beyond that, but we can max out everything right under that line and that affects the quality of life. And so when we use those testings, that's what we're looking at. On to the next. And, I might, and after I do this one, I'm going to pause for a second because now I'm in letter C and I want to get either a thumbs up or down or something to keep going this way or if I should go and just start taking questions. So this is the CAT test. Um, it's a projective test that looks at a, how a child's personality is developing. 
Um, this one is a good one that I often order them to do because I'm like, how does this kid really feel about what's happening around them? How are they digesting that? And so they take ambiguous information and they ask them to tell me a story using these words or these objects. And that's how, how kids play will always tell you what's going on. If they're upset about something, if they're worried a lot, it'll play out. You know, if the kid is happy, everybody in the story won't die. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but they do it in a very method, a methoded way that, you know, it meets out. All right. Pausing right there. Are we good so far? Should I keep going this way? Okay, I'm getting some thumbs up. Okay, let's keep going. So now we're looking at the CTMT2, which is the Comprehensive Trail Making Test. Um, this measure is telling us whether there's a brain injury. I know oftentimes, and I won't go into that part today because, again, I'm taking something that's huge because people spend their entire career doing psychological tests and I'm trying to condense it down to its barest form so that you can get what you can get and keep it moving because you got other stuff to do than be scratching your head and pulling your hair out. But if this test comes back indicating that there's a possibility of brain injury, you'll often see in the psychological recommendations for a brain map to give us a picture of the brain to tell us what's going on up there and whether it's something that we can adjust, augment, or fix or whether, oh gosh, oh dear, we'll bless it. You know, we're looking for those two spaces um, to look at what we can do. So we're looking at the indicators on the frontal lobe deficits. It'll tell us if there's a psychomotor speed processing issue, which we can do some things for. Um, visual search and sequencing, impairments of attention. And oftentimes if we see a kid that's spinning like a top, the two primary diagnoses that comes to mind to a diagnostician is either ADHD or anxiety. This test can help us really suss out which one of the two um, is winning in a sense. Like, is it anxiety or is it ADHD? Like, or is it both? Or in how much they're affected by it so that we can know how to introduce the proper treatment um, aspects to help that recover and get better. Um, if it's um, psychosis, we need meds for that. So these tests really do help us project how we start stepping to the plate as practitioners for the outcomes. The next test, um, for me, this is a big um, kid on the block, the FAM-3, which is a family assessment measure. Um, anybody over the age of 10 within the family, whether one household or two, because sometimes we'll have two parents fighting over a kid in two different households, this lets us get a very good picture of the dysfunction um, between the parents, between the child, what the parents are projecting versus what the child is getting. And we, we, can, we have a parenting program at Advanced, um, and I'm Made the main person over it right now. And in that in that program, we administer this measure and it helps me to target treatment wise where your dysfunction is and help you say, okay, this is how we're going to look at that. Let's process through therapeutically in a psychoeducation responsive way and then a regular therapeutic way. And then we have a coach that comes along and works with them as well with the goal of doing rehabilitative work. And it also can tell me where there's psychopathy, which is something we can't fix. So a parent with a um, personality disorder, that's pretty rigid. We can't change that. So we shouldn't be treating it as if we can, because again, that only uh, oftentimes will devastate the child. And so this gives us good directives and our back and forth reliance with the courts and letting them know, hey, this is not necessarily fixable. So if this being fixed is integral to this child returning to this environment, we can't fix it. And so, and then in other ways, hey, this is pretty dysfunctional, but we can do things and then mom can demonstrate. And then we do usually a retest at different intervals to see if they're actually picking up what we're putting down. And then we also are looking for evidence of putting those things into practice. So with that measure, you'll see, um, a lot of that going back and forth with courts when they're trying to do reunification or consider it or make sure that it's appropriate. Okay, so the Mackey, this is a um, child inventory. This is given to teens and adolescents, and it's looking at how that kid is getting along in the world that they're in in comparison to their same age peers. So a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old should not be getting the same score. Um, but it also is a good indicator sometimes for ADHD because oftentimes a kid with ADHD 
anxiety, autism, they will be three to five years behind in their social development. And so this can help us clue in on, hey, what's going on up there is the deprivation of environment. You know, this will help us kind of tease out some of that. Now, as you see, each test has a different piece of the pie that it brings to the table. So by the time you get to the recommendations at the bottom of a psychological assessment, you're able to better have a picture of what's going on with each kid as a whole piece of a pie, a whole pie versus the pieces. So that's why some of the testing pieces have like repeat measure aspects to them while others are just pulling out different slithers and pieces. Some of them are taking up bigger chunks and others are tiny diet size slices. Um, the microcog, um, oh, I didn't put the full name of that one. I will fix that. This is a cognitive screening tool. Now, screening tools can be administered pretty quickly. Um, we're looking at memory, mental processing, and after that one is administered, if there's deficits enough, they'll go down that intelligence route and figure out, are we unpacking um, a disorder? Or it, And sometimes it might be deprivation of environment. If we look at how today, especially after COVID, many kids made it through the pandemic with these in front of their faces. Um, and because they had screens, they weren't getting that social interaction that is integral to development. And so you'll see their spatial reasoning is really, really poor. Like you tell them to go across the room and they're walking all the way around the space rather than straight to the point. Um, doing some of these um, things that we do, and I won't call it lazy parenting because parenting is hard. I have four children. It's very hard. Um, you, when you take a shortcut, you literally are robbing P Peter to pay Paul in some ways. And if they do it extensively, you start to see an impact and effect in testing. And so is that a cognitive deficit or is that a deficit in the environment that we need to correct through treatment? Um, these tests and these many forms can help us start to shape out how that works. I'm already to the letter M. So now we're in N. We're getting there. Um, yeah, N is halfway through. So and I'm racing through this part to get to the part so that you guys can talk to me more and tell me specifics about what you need. The NEPC, um, this is the neurological assessment for, I call them all kids, um, kids age three to 16. Um, they're looking at six domains. This is the first heavy hitter I like to grab a hold of because it gives me a good picture. Attention and executive functioning. Those are two primary places for ADHD. Language memory and learning, social per, uh, perception, sensory motor, visual spatial processing. This will let me know whether I need to have an ADRI ordered or not if it's coming up low in a lot of these areas because all six of those domains are no domains for neurodivergence, even though the NEPSI is not a primary tool that's used to um, diagnose autism. It often is a tool that leads to a diagnosis because it tells that practitioner to dig deeper. Um, and that's how a lot of these tools work together. Like they might be having these problems. The parents aren't the best reporters in the world. The kid performs poorly on these measures. And we're like, hold on, autism, ADHD, like what's going on there? And we dig harder. And sometimes we're able to find an end to the means despite the lack of information available. So we even have, you know, the checks and balances in mind there. Okay, next slide. PAI, that's a personality assessment. Um, okay, that was weird. A personality assessment inventory. Um, we're looking at personality and psychopathology. There's a cyclical nature to psychopathology because it always leads you back to the start point. When personality de development, it should have a level of flexibility and rigidity that's balanced that allows us to go into different situations, solve problems from multiple perspectives, have um, what I call anchors, locus of controls, values, beliefs, morality, things like that. If all of that is fluid, that's not good. If all of that is rigid, that's not good. Is it a deficit because of the environment of maybe having a mentally ill parent? Sometimes. Is it a deficit because the brain has malformation? Sometimes. But again, when we administer multiple tests together, we start to get a picture that's painted out um, and that can be helpful. PSI-2, Psychological Screening Inventory, um, it's a pathway assessment and it provides um, 
indicators about whether or not additional testing is warranted. So this is, we don't have enough information at all to know anything. I just got this kid. He came into my office and screaming, or he wouldn't talk at all. But I gather from his presentation that I'm not going to be able to get the report from this child for one reason or the other. But if we administer this screen, it will tell us if there's areas that we need to really be focusing on in the testing process so that we don't miss something. And so this is one of those, I call it a safety net assessment that I'll often throw out there when I feel like I, I'm missing something or your gut instinct is telling you, they're not telling me everything that they need to tell me. Hold on one second. Um, okay. Um, Ms. Gleason, I don't have sample questions. I started to go down that rabbit hole, <laughs> but we would be here all day. Um, I will say that oftentimes what will happen with the sample questions, because this is why I didn't include them, is if I give a sample question to the test, that oftentimes starts to skew our perspective of what that measure is supposed to be measuring because some of the test questions, just like in any other testing that you've taken to get any type of certification, they're throwouts. There are test questions that are supposed to be what we call fake good or fake bad. Um, and when we have a fake bad, that is to indicate whether a person is going to lie. And there's two kinds of lies that you'll see in testing. One of those lies is my arm is missing and the person's like screaming, my arm is gone, my arm is gone when they really are working around with the paper cut. So they've over-exaggerate. I call it the chicken little situation. Um, they over-report everything because they really want you to see that they're not okay. Um, the other one is their arm is missing and they're like, oh, it's a paper cut, it'll be fine. I'm like, no, you're dying. Um, some people try to minimize because they don't wanna be a bother. They wanna not have the situation be big. So they pretend like it's small in hopes that that's a coping skill. Both of those spectrums are maladaptive coping practices. So I didn't include test questions because I don't want that, I don't know which questions to specifically pick and choose to show you, um, a good warranted example of this is what it looks like. Um, most of the testing um, is done in a room that's pretty naked and bare. It's not like overly decorated. Um, those are the therapist offices that like, it looks like a toy shop threw up in my office because I work with a lot of children. But when you go into a testing space, it's very clinically, very, um, I call it Zen, because it's minimal. Um, some of the tests are administered via a computer so that you don't even have that conduit of them trying to impress the person that they're testing with. Um, and you get a better rapport that way. Some of them, you're sitting there interacting with them and they're really observing how you're responding to the questions being asked when you're fatiguing, how you handle that frustration, all of that might play into it. So it just depends on how the me measure is administered. Um, but the outcomes that come from those measures are what we really want to focus on. Um, so I didn't go into the question part because one, we'd be here all day and two, I'd be talking about absolutely nothing. Um, so I did that one. So now we're at the SASE. You guys see this one a lot. This one is administered to the parents of children that were removed from their environment because of substances or suspected substance use. Uh, maybe the drug screen, because a lot of our illegal substances come out of the system quickly. Um, it may have, it may not show up on the screen because you kind of have to catch a person pretty soon after they use the lot to see. Um, I keep having pop ups, sorry, to see like the impact. Well, these substance use screenings they assist in differentiating the probability of an addiction, a use, a dependence. You know those different aspects. Um, I like these assessments because they actually provide me with an awareness of how that person is approaching the process of being assessed as well, um, because you'd end up seeing um, whether they lie or not a lot, or whether they're even in touch with their level of use, because some people are full-blown addicts, but they think they're social drinkers, you know, or they, they feel like, oh yeah, this is just something I do, but it's not really impacting my life when it's really having devastating effects, whether they are a minimizer or an over-reporter. Um, they're saying, I drink every day, but the test is really indicating that they just overindulge on the weekends, you know? So, but these assessments are done when they're done well. You wanna look at um, the discrepancies in information. 
that's a good way to read this one. Um, if the person is reporting that they don't use at all, but then later on in the assessment, the assessor reports on the client's tendency to get high on every Friday, that's not congruent. And so that's deception. And so those are the things that you're looking at. Those also lead to the space of where are we going to go in treatment? Because your honesty is the thing that you're going to absolutely need as a tool to help you get through the situation of whatever type of fracture um, the parent or relationship has had in relation to whatever has happened. So, all right, I'm going to peek up here at the chat box again. Okay. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about the invalid. <laughs> um, that's my favorite. This one's um, so what happens with invalid? If I have a test that has a reliability rate of a certain threshold, and I'll talk about the numbers and I will make the numbers make sense to you. That is my main goal today. So when you're looking at it, you're like, okay, I know what this is talking about. Um, if a kid is coming and saying I was traumatized, and I say, Well, how? Because a lot of kids, they're pretty, they can be pretty dramatic. They start telling a story about how they saw a bear once and then they saw it in a magazine, but then it became a bear that was in the room. And then they were in the cage in the room with the bear and the bear, you know, it just gets bigger and bigger. We can't use that. So, but even with the invalid results, we can't say that this is their score. We can say that this kid score is invalid, whether or not they meant to deceive us we can determine that part and we can determine what they're trying to convey. They're letting you know that it really is affecting them on a deep level and they may not have the language for expressing that. And so that's something we can address therapeutically or do they have psychosis? Because sometimes invalid results result in psychosis because you can't test someone that's not in the room with you. Um, that's the, the base rule on that. Um, and, and a person's in the room with you, but they're not present and they don't have presence of mind. That is going to impact the outcomes of testing. So when we run into invalid, depending on the reasons why, those are still going to give recommendations and directives towards what we do next. If it's psychosis, medication comes first because you've got to be present in order to be able to learn and grow and think differently and move. If it's um, they're over responsive, then we need to come in with trauma treatment. We got to get that registered, titrated to a normative level. And we might go back for a retest if it's necessary, but sometimes if we can alleviate the symptoms and then once they feel safety and understand how to facilitate safety, then they can move forward in that. Um, and you just looking at it from that perspective, that's how we do that. Now, are we okay with me taking these little mini breaks to take questions here and there to kind of break up the monotony of going through the test? I want to make sure I'm flowing. The so, right. like, so Sophia, I have a few questions to ask while you're still on the substance use piece. Um, I was going to put it into the chat, but I figured it'll just be easier to mm -hmm. ask. Um, so how often should a parent <clears throat> that is suspected of substance abuse, how often should they come or be sent to get a psychological eval. Like, you know, obviously, you know, substances will alter their everyday life. But, you know, if I see that a mom is coming to get a psychological eval and I know that she's actively using, wouldn't that alter her results some or if any? Okay. So if the mother is actively using, that's been kind of reported as the concern and the, re the referral for testing, right? Mm -hmm. And we go in and test in, and let's say mom completely denies her substance use, right? Um, ideally, and I'm going to explain my ideally, we would admit that mom into a substance use treatment program that's appropriate for the level of use. You know, you don't have the same treatment for alcohol abuse that you do for opiates. Um, that's not how that works. Unfortunately, this is ideally, um, since COVID, we've had an exacerbated number of people that are in need of some type of substance use treatment because substances became a lot of people's maladaptive coping mechanism. And because of that, we're in a space where we don't always have either available bed or we might not have available practitioner or practitioner may be overwhelmed with clients and not doing the best 
at reporting back and forth, usually the testing needs to be done on the front end. And if they're in with a substance abuse counselor, which I am not, that's one of those treatments. I have two modalities under belt. I know how to render the treatment, but I don't render the treatment because I'll only stay in the lanes that I can do well. Um, and so, but what a person is doing SA treatment should be able to do is be reporting back and forth to whoever the powers that be on how they're progressing through the treatment whether or not they're giving lip service or whether they can show receipts for their behaviors. Um, so if she's coming to you intoxicated and inebriated, that's a clear indicator that treatment's not necessarily where it, it's not finished, um, but right. relapse is a part of every model of substance use. Harm reduction is a part of most modes of substance use, um, with the exception of, couple, of a few that just like you're hardcore off of this stuff, because if you take one sip, you are off the wagon. And for some substances like opiates, yes, that is how that works. Um, but because we live in a society where social drinking is a thing, um, people have to figure out where they fall within the space of being able to engage in certain behaviors. If she got custody of the kids, but she sends the kids off to her mom um, for a long weekend, and the first Friday that they're gone, she's using marijuana, as long as it's not violating the court orders, she's within her rights because by the time the kids come back to her, she's not intoxicated anymore. And so you have to look at each thing differently. Now, if she's using opiates, that's not going to be passable because it's not like she could just stop. Um, so, and then with alcohol, it person to person, it wavers. And a lot of times what we would need is like directives from court systems as far as what's expected. If 100% sobriety is what is expected, then they have to maintain that. If they're not able to maintain that structure, then we need to look at something else. A good substance abuse treatment program often includes testing for the substance that you're trying to heal from. Um, so they might go on an abuse if they're alcoholic to ensure that if you take an abuse and you drink, you are going to get sick. Um, if you are taking Suboxone or a methadone for your opiate addiction, it's going to relieve those cravings. And so then being in outpatient services to work on your coping mechanisms is going to be an imperative so that you just don't return to it out of force a habit. Um, so each thing has its space of being addressed. So it's not like point A, point B, connect the dots. It's point A, let's assess this. How is it affecting things? What are the expectations? And so figuring out what to do from there. Um, there have, with me in clinical practice, because I started out in community mental health, I have had where I knew a parent had that type of mandate and I'm working with the child and I say, okay, so this is what we're going to do because I have a duty to report. It was made clear to me by the courts when they passed your child back to you that you're not supposed to be using. You're clearly intoxicated. Client is clearly in your custody right now and you're intoxicated. So that's a violation. We're going to make two calls. The first call is probably going to be to Cortland because that's where everybody goes. Let's get you over there and get you with somebody. The second call is going to be the social services. And we're going to do that together. And you're going to tell them that you need help because I'm pairing with you because it's our goal for the kids to stay within the home, but they need to stay within a healthy home. And this isn't going to work. And because I approach it that way and I've built rapport and they know it's not my goal to have their children taken away from them, like I'm not out to get them. I've had parents come to me over the years and say, Miss Strange is not working. I need some help. I'm falling apart. Um, I drank last weekend and I don't want to, but I feel like I might, you know, and it really allows for us to partner and get people to the services they need. So you have to use your rapport. You have to use all of those skills and you have to do that duty to um, inform. And sometimes it's not, a, you know, to the advantage to let the parent know that you're going to call because they might have narcissistic tendencies. But if they're a parent that's onboarded with, this is a struggle for me. And you're coming alongside for me advocating for my children and cheering me on. I'm okay with letting you know that. And I've had that happen. And that usually gets me that unique result. Um, it's not the same every case. There's sometimes I just wish the parent would buy in and partner with me because I feel like we're on opposite sides of the field. But then other times there's a good pairing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Um, you know, I, I've seen pretty frequently of, um, you know, different court orders saying, you know, 
you're to not use, you know, any substances, especially in a caretaking role. And, you know, the example that you provided, of course, you know, mom sends kids off for a long weekend and she indulges in whatever substance, you know, she's still within her right because she's not in a caretaking role. But um, so, yeah, it definitely, definitely covered that. Um, and then like overall, I know that you said that you'll sit most of the time that they go to like a substance use, um, you know, like provider or, you know, Pathway treatment plan for that. Yeah. But at any time, like post, you know, like they get out and they complete the treatment, do at any time, like the post, um, the post, the post care? effects, you yeah. know, does that still alter the psych eval or potentially not? It doesn't have any effect on it. Okay, so where it will affect the psych eval is if it's picked up on in the testing, it'll indicate that, hey, they have this substance use disorder and it looks like it's in partial remission or it's relapsed or, you know, they'll speak to it in that form. Um, and it's up to the powers that be to do something with the information. The psychological is not the police. The psychological is often the warrant for your arrest, if that makes sense in those situations. Um, usually if you would complete a good substance use program, at the end of that program, they're gonna tell you what to do if you relapse. If that program doesn't have relapse prevention, relapse care, it's not a good program. <laughs> that That's just, that's if you're gonna build a program with substance use at the helm of it, those are the two things you have to figure out first because falling off the wagon is often a part because you didn't just start drinking for no reason. You drank for a reason and we're going to treat the reason you started drinking, but we've also got to understand the patterns of use. Um, so usually they know what they should be doing and it's a matter of having that conversation with them and talking them through, hey, you're not doing as good as you was doing the last time I saw you. What's going on? What's got you stressed out? Okay, so when did you start drinking again? I don't ask them, are you drinking? I know you're drinking. I can smell it. So when did you start drinking again? Um, I And I, I'm... I'm good at that type of a rapport because honestly, I grew up in that type of an environment, not in my own home, but I grew up in the inner city of Chicago and you see it all there. Um, so <laughs> I'm pretty exposed to things. So I know how to just kind of meet people where they are and just have an open conversation with them about the struggles that they're having. Um, and then sometimes if I know they went through a really hard thing, I might ask them as a checkpoint. So what did you do instead of drinking, you know, or what did you do instead of getting high? Like, and they'll, they'll say, man, I wanted to, I wanted to, but I didn't. I called my sponsor. And then I sat there and the sponsor was getting on my nerves, hung up from her, <laughs> called my grandma. She started bugging me out too. So I went and I just sat in the church and I cried for a while. Then I made an appointment with my therapist, but she canceled on me. But and I was like, so let's talk about this. What you going to do to take care of yourself? And sometimes we can head it off there. I'll say, well, let's pause this appointment. You go ahead and call your therapist and reset that appointment. You know, it's, it's COVID season. People do get sick. Let's let's look at it and then just try to encourage them to keep going because sometimes that little bit right there is the difference between that relapse and and because with the relapse comes usually the lying the minimizing and you know you know the patterns and I usually talk in stories metaphors pictures and I start painting the pictures like it's you sounding a little chicken little today what, what's really happening or you know that sort of thing um so it's really about that relationship and psychological testing will never replace relationship um when it comes to the treatment aspects um so if they're attempted to conceal their patterns of abuse that's an indicator if they're over reporting i do it all the next question that will shut them up so who hurt you because yeah. you basically telling me that you're killing yourself with gusto. It's one thing, you know, to cut loose if that's the way you want to do that. But if you're doing it all, what are you running from? You know, so really that relationship and that camaraderie, it can kind of help through that. Right. Did I get the essay questions? Because I know this yes. is the only, I think this is might be the only substance use measure that was thrown in there. Okay. The Stroop. Oh, my friend, the Stroop. So we're looking at, <laughs> this one kind of throws people into like a little bit of a tailspin um, for fun. Go to YouTube and watch a video on the Stroop. This is the one where you'll see the letter, the, the color red written out in blue ink. And you'll see the color blue written out in red ink. And they'll say, what color is this word? 
but because re written communication is processed in our brain before visual, you'll get the wrong answer. And then, and they have a lot of, it's like, I call it the mind game test because it's really looking at your ability to give an answer that feels unusual, think critically and come out right. There's a certain level of deficit that can indicate on this test, some levels of um, psychosis sometimes if they really like failing it terribly. Um, it definitely helps with ADHD. Um, and then that cognitive interference, that's the psychosis, the processing speed, that's how long does it take you to figure out that two plus two equals four, but maybe we're solving for X instead because of the way that it, and it keeps layering until you just completely bottom out and it kind of gives us a uh, understanding of your capacity to shift and change. And so sometimes when you run into those types of rigidity in parenting, it definitely can point to, okay, there is a cognitive deficit here. So if the baby starts crying, I pick up the baby and I cuddle it. Okay, so what if that doesn't work? What do you mean? It always works. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, and so it, it's looking at where those that capacity where it stops at or where it's hindered. Um, so we use that assessment. It's a quick one. It doesn't take that long. Um, the TAT, the thematic apperception test, it's a projective, so it kind of tells us where we're going. Um, that when you think projective, think projectile, think throwing towards the future. So it's telling us if we continue now without interventions, we can kind of ascertain that this is going to go this way. So you want to layer your projective test with your test that tells you where you are now, and then a projective test tells you where you're going from that point, if that makes sense. Um, there's describing ambiguous scenes, learn more about a person's emotions, attitudes, impulses, motivations, and personality. Um, this is, let's take a kid that's coming out of domestic violence. Like they've seen mom and dad fight every Sunday. The police come to the house once a week to tell them to quiet down. The neighbors sometimes get involved and it's very chaotic and hectic. And so you start giving them projectives and you're asking them about ambiguous scenes. And people are always fighting, cheating, cussing, lying, stealing, and all those themes are playing out. That's where we going. We need to disrupt that because we don't want to keep this going. We want to put a stop to it and start pushing towards health. But when you do a tat, you get to see some pretty interesting things go down <laughs> administering this, this test. Um, now, the TOMO um, test of memory and learning, this is a nationally standardized test. And we're looking at the function of your memory. Um, a lot of times, this can be an indicator of trauma. Because I know we've all met an adult, or there might even be some here, I'm not trying to step on toes or nothing, but whenever I meet an adult that tells me, I don't remember my childhood, and then I assess further, and they say, I have no trauma, that's not how that works. <laughs> Um, so the TOMO is looking at, because your brain will start dumping things that are non-essential to your survival to keep you alive. Once you get into that habit and structure, then you end up with poor memory. That's because you're spending too much time in flight and flight. Because we got flight, flight, freezer, freezer, faint. And so the TOMO is able to kind of pick up on what's that looking like. It also, if you have low memory function, where's your cognitive scoring? So that's why we need other tests to help test along with painting the full picture. So if they have good cognitive reasoning, IQ is well above 120, they're genius but they can't remember a thing. You've just shown me somebody with trauma or maybe psychosis, depending on what the other measures say. If they can't remember a thing and they're like buzzing all around the place, that's trauma. But if they can't remember a thing because they run into a space, tear up everything and then turn around and say, who did that? That might be ADHD with a little bit of trauma. So it's like each thing can give you different indicators depending upon how this test plays with that measure. And then you get all that together and you get this long, sometimes 15 page document because it's test after test after test after test. And so you wanna know what each test represents. And so you'll see what parts of a person the test is speaking to. So when you start out, you're not gonna be able to just whip right through it, but this should help you paint that picture over time and you get better and better and better and better at increased and repeated exposure. And so that's why I wanted to create this like this because I know that this is what helped me when I was first starting out. I had flashcards like 
how do I do this? <laughs> like, what is this again? What do we just look for? Um, and I'll get to the math part next. Now, this one, the waist, um, which is anytime you see waist, whisk, whipsy, all of them were developed by Weschler. Um, and so each of them have different monikers after, and they, and these are the tests that gets into more of that cognitive and really good diagnostic measure tools. This is where it gets a meteor test. And with the test like this, you want to look at the other acronyms after Weschler. So you could just say, oh, it's an intelligence test. If you see the W, it's an intelligence test. That's a, a good cheat there. Um, you'll know who you're testing. There's some you give to adults only. There's some you give to adults and children. There's some for children only, and there's some for young children. And so it's up to the practitioner to determine which one is best. If I have a person that is purely severely socially impacted by autism to where I'm pretty sure they don't know how to count their money because they also have intellectual disabilities, and I wanted to get a waste done, I probably wouldn't send them for the Adult, I'd send them for the other one that has adult and children because I know they won't even get anywhere near the threshold. Not only that, it'll just tell me that they failed it and they have ID and they'll get a cognitive IQ score. It'll be really low, but it won't tell me that, hey, they have the IQ of a six-year-old because it's not going to meet that out because they're expecting you to be a, at least 18 to take this. So you have to use that art form of understanding the baseline of who you're dealing with. That's why a lot of our tests, when we don't have the information available, we might just start off with the base clinical interview and try to gather as much information as possible. Now, if it's one of those cases that they have been around the block and they've had other tests done in other places, providing that information at the front end of testing can definitely impact the outcomes, because now we will know really for sure if something's indicating a brain injury and we know there was a major accident, well, now here's the proof in the pudding. Or if this happened in testing and testing looked this way and then a trauma happened and now this is what testing looks like, oh boy, now we know what that cause and effect relationship might be and that'll inform treatment. So sometimes I'll hear people say, I'm going to send the kid for testing, but I'm not giving them the test that the school did. Or I'm sending them for testing at the school, but I'm not going to give them the test that you did. I've talked with several psychologists in our area that do testing. They all agree the more testing, the better as far as having all the information to deal with. Because again, that art form piece, is, because the test is not telling us who you are. It's telling us what you're dealing with. Like there's still personality aspects and getting to know that person and walking them through and getting them better. Um, so it's not like a fight or a game, it's science. <laughs> so with the waste, it's looking for the cognitive ability, that's the vocabulary, comprehension, because I've met people that sound like they went to college, but they can't read. And I've met people that have the comprehension of what I would think a, a astrophysicist would have, but their vocabulary is just terrible. Um, arithmetic, can you count your money? Can you count my money? Can you know, can you make it make numbers make sense? Is your reasoning skills good? And so if I see deficits in areas, then it's going to help me understand a little bit more about that person. Um, a few of the resulting diagnostics, and these are some that I currently commonly treat. There are more resulting diagnostics because this is an extensive scale. ADHD, which I think a lot of children are being diagnosed with, and because there's a nature nurture component to that, because if we don't have a child pay attention and they're watching Coco Melon, those videos are like crack to the brain because they're stimulating that frontal lobe over time. And so that kid can't slow down enough to sit still enough to make hypotheses and draw conclusion at an age appropriate level. And it's going to impact the outcomes of their testing. That's purely environmental. And then we get that kid in treatment and I'm working with them on mindfulness and slowing down, paying attention, playing appropriately, limiting their screen time, not to punish them, but to help their brains grow, teaching them how to play outside maybe, then that kid's testing will look completely different. This is why sometimes you'll have a kid come into care and they had very low scores when the school did their testing three years ago and they were living in utter chaos. And then you put them in a nurturing optimal environment and they get tested and they look like a genius. 
that sometimes is what's going on in between those spaces, intellectual disabilities. And there's concrete disabilities is this is what your brain is capable of. And then there's the disabilities of this is only what your brain has been exposed to. We can fix what your brain has been exposed to. We may not be able to get as much movement of what it's capable of unless we can find other organic causes that are getting in the way of that. Does that make sense so far? Okay, moving on. Um, another Wessler test. This is the achievement one. Um, and I put the additions because these additions change. And every time these additions change, practitioner is expected to upgrade, even though it's kind of like when if any of if you all went to college, how they change from addition two to addition three in the textbooks. They change two pictures and make one spelling check um, correction. And now the book, you've got to buy it for $160 instead of the old edition for 50 so, but sometimes it, it makes some updates and sometimes it, it's for the publishers to make money. It's, that's the, the, the level of how that works. It's kind of frustrating sometimes, but that's how that works. Um, it measures the same areas as the waist. Um, however, this one is for children and adults. Remember I told you about that cognitively impacted adult that acts like a child? This is what I'd order for him, because not only is it going to tell me that he's ID, I know he's ID, I just need to know how ID he is and where he is, so that when he comes in, if he comes in with the IQ of a third grader, I'm going to meet him where he is, versus if he's coming in with the sixth grade IQ, I'm going to meet him where he is to help him get locus of control, bring those behaviors down, work on those cognitions, that's thinking, thinking get all of that gathered so we can at least get better behavioral outcomes where the deficits are. Um, and so that's how that impacts treatment. And so again, the same areas, um, we're talking about the score base. This slide I will reference back to in a little bit because we're getting towards the end and I stuck that there um, for a reason and that'll make sense. Those high average, superior, very um, superior, above very superior, we'll come back to that. Let me check the time. Okay, making sure I'm doing good on time. Okay, um, the WISC, um, this is for children 6 to 16, um, is often used for the diagnosis of intellectual and learning disabilities. If I get a client that comes in and they're underperforming in school, getting suspended all the time for behaviors because when kids can't be successful, they act out. Um, a lot of times what might be a behavioral problem could be masking a cognitive deficit. And so I get in there, I work with them on behaviors to control the um, control their bodies, their hands, their feelings, and all of that. And then we can chop in on where that those deficits are, and we can start working towards them being the best version of themselves. And that's going to have a different type of projection, because that kid's going to walk away if we go back and do um, the test that looks at their projector perspective of life. If you did a before and after on that, you'll see everybody dying in story one, but then him become an astronaut in story two because they're looking at their future with a lot more hope to it because it's not necessarily about what they can't do it's about what they can do um is how we use that therapeutically and so that's six to 16 diagnosis of intellectual and learning disabilities comes often from this test or sometimes i've had it come in where a kid doesn't have good verbal language, doesn't make eye contact, we're pretty sure he's on the spectrum. And I've had it happen a couple of times. Yeah, his IQ is a 140. Okay, Einstein, let's get you some help. So you can start demonstrating that everywhere. Uh, maybe they're fatiguing out and becoming easily frustrated from being asked to do the same things over and over because our education system is pretty repetitive because repeat is how we learn in America. So looking at just different dynamics and how they're playing into helping that kid build more resilience and tolerance might be the way that treatment would go because of seeing those things. And that helps me change the directives of treatment. Okay, whoopsie. This is for my little fellas, um, ages two years and six months to seven years, seven months. Um, I love this assessment. I work with all autism spectrum throughout life. So um, I work with kids that can't talk sometimes. But this one is based on how can you functionally connect and do. Like if I give you a task to stack these blocks, do this and follow me and let's see how long you stay with it. This can give me a baseline of what's going on. Now, something to note, when it comes to intelligence testing, um, Medicaid and most insurance providers, but Medicaid specifically when we're looking at waiver, because I did start out working with waivers, um, they want five years, nine months. The standard practice is to usually go six years solid. 
um, before you would take those assessments and put someone um, into ID services if they do come up intellectually disabled. Because I keep talking about nature versus nurture. If the um, environment is neglect, that's going to render into the intelligence test. And it's going to look like a kid can't do what they may be capable of doing. If we address that gap, even if it's neglect of, um, I've seen kids that had um, debilitating a birth injury. And that birth injury made it harder for them to learn. And while that kid appeared with intellectual disabilities at the onset, because of good interventions, they might come out with a developmental delay and not necessarily cross the th threshold into intellectual disabilities. So these tests, this one specifically, is not set in stone. If this one is administered, um, I'd always recommend in three to five years after this test to administer a new test after interventions have been provided to really give a better picture. The other thing is we have brain plasticity, meaning your brain can still learn, stretch, grow, and move. You know, it doesn't harden until we're like 26. Um, but when it can learn, stretch, grow, and move, we've got some time in there. That's why the early intervention strategies are the biggest push. Um, because that really helps there to get in there. But getting these scores at this point is a good baseline because it gives us information on where to start. Are we trying to build stamina to start with? Are we trying to expand their awareness of what's going on around them and get them out of their own little world? How much of you is present with me in this space? So oftentimes if I have a young child that is newly diagnosed with autism, maybe they went and saw a neurodevelopmental pedi pediatrician that says, hey, this kid does look autistic, but we need to substantiate the diagnosis. Parents are good historians. They come right in. We do an ADRI. It's starting to test positive for autism. Autism, little fellas like three and a half, four years old, let's get a whipsy. Because if you're going to send them to me for cognitive and ABA informed treatment, I need to know where we are. And so I'll lean heavily on this assessment to see that. And I've seen kids come in completely nonverbal and walk out gifted because it kind of gives me a good, a better space of where they are. And while we have all these <gasps> at the beginning, at the end, we're like, oh, I don't even know who that kid is anymore. And that's what makes this work addictive, um, personally. <laughs> All right, moving on. Do we need a break? So can feel, please feel free to put it into the chat or unmute and we can take a five minute break. I, I would like a five minute break. Okay. okay, I'm going to set my timer for five minutes. All right, and, and we'll, we'll pick back up at 5.08. Okay.
Okay, I am back. I'm looking at the chat, and I answered one of the questions through writing, and then I ran and grabbed another bottle of water because mine was empty. Um, the waste is testing for adults. Um, that's always an adult intelligence test. If it's an adult that has um, pretty severe cognitive deficits or you don't feel like they're going to test well, then you'd want to why it instead. Now, how does the evaluator detect if a person is being deceptive? And which, of course, now see, here's the thing. Not all deception leads to an invalid result because everybody does a little bit of lying. Um, I feel like sometimes in the role of mental health professionals, advocates, we get lied to for a living sometimes. And so that is a dynamic that does happen. However, there's an incongruence about lying that becomes decep deception. It's almost a sense of gaslighting the test. For instance, if I were to check a box on a substance test that says that drinking in front of a child is never okay, but then later on in that assessment, I'm asked, and it's to say it's true, false, and basis, that it's okay to drink at a kid's birthday party as long as there are adults present to provide care. Both of those things can't be true because those are clearly defined moral statements. So usually you'll have tests built with measures that'll flip-flop questions, ask questions that lead up to specific, um, how do I say, um, they lead up to specific outcomes or expectations. Like if, if I had to like conceptualize it, I guess what I would say is if you have, I, I have this picture of an old like church mother that's right is right is wrong is wrong. And then you have a full blown liberal feminist. They're not going to sound the same. They're going to be polar opposites in how they complete a lot of an assessment that has like morality inclusion, not necessarily saying whether morality is right or wrong, is looking at that dynamic of are you telling the truth? And so the assessor is not necessarily saying, I feel like you're lying. It's your response to the questions where the test itself will tell you, they just lied to you. The test does it. So that part isn't just, I had this gut feeling that they were lying. A lot of times when parents come in for like the parent to come program, the first thing they'll say is that assessor pretended to be my friend and then just lied about me. And I know from how these assessments are rendered, no, you lied on the assessment and the assessor just reported what you did. They weren't there to be your friend. They were there to tell the truth based off of what the assessment went rendered. Um, I've administered different trauma assessments that have these same built-ins that'll let me know when results are valid or not. And when those results are valid or invalid, it has no, no bearing on the relationship I have with that person. Because sometimes there's a variance of lying to me versus lying to yourself, which definitely happens on substance use testing because they I don't have a problem. I drink every time I get a chance. Yes. I've never tried to cut back on my use. Absolutely not. Um, I've had legal troubles because of my use. Wouldn't be here if I, if I didn't. That's clearly <laughs> a person that's struggling with addiction, but they might not have that awareness or insight that that's what's going on. So it's not necessarily a person sitting in the box playing the Wizard of Oz saying that you lied. The test measure is going to have that automatically built in. Does that make sense? Okay, so does cash cost? No, you guys don't administer the test. I don't even administer the test. I leave that to the psychometricians, the psychologists. I administer screening tools. I have administered an ADOS before, but I try not to because that's Pandora's box. Um, there's about a year long wait for that. <laughs> I don't have the time to say, okay, I'm going to do this or I would get flooded more so than I already am. Um, 
it is up to DSS to interpret and, interpret and apply these results when they make their recommendation. So it does rely, I think most of the, our DSS workers have a master's degree, so they've taken the coursework. It's about whether or not they retain that information and actively use it. Um, if they're using that information appropriately, then they should be able to make good recommendations that are solid. Um, with you guys being the court appointed advocates, when you feel like they might be slacking, because my understanding is I work with kids all over the state um, through DSS, they're drowning. Um, you have in some offices three DSS workers covering an entire catchment area, which is insanity, when just six years ago there were maybe 23 workers. Um, and so because of that, they're clicking boxes and putting out fires, which makes your job that much more important, which is why I hopped on it when they said they wanted you guys to be able to do this, because the Secondary defense is now quickly becoming a front line, so I can only imagine some of the frustrations that you guys have to deal with, because now you're going to see what I see, and that's going to be the frustrating part, but you guys will be able to do your role as an advocate to help them see what you see, too, to help us catch things before, you know, kids fall through the cracks, because that's what we all want to avoid. Um, so they have that training, depending on how much they invested in their retention of it, you know, that's from person to person, um, That and that's one of the, I would say, the peaks and valleys of working anywhere in mental health or mental health adjacent um but some I've met therapists and workers as I have no clue what this is saying and usually I try to set aside a time to do not this but something similar but I definitely will be using this presentation in the future to say hey here's your quick cheat sheet um because I do tend to share information freely because you don't need to get paid for everything um <laughs> so that we can be better as a community for our people um now those are the questions that were there keep them coming in the chat I'll make sure I look now our next thing we're going to do is get into the space of reading a psychological. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but I want to make it clear, we got to get in the headspace for it and get a base understanding and awareness of what we're looking at. So I'm going to go over this next slide, and then I'm going to pull up a psychological. We're going to do what I do when I'm teaching a client something. I teach them a skill. I move away from that skill to something else the distraction and then I come back and apply the skill because that's how we get that retention to know that I really pay attention and understand what she was saying so I'm going to do a little visual here I have this cup and this cup let's pretend like these are two different tests this is a 20 ounce this is a 40 ounce it's not a Stanley it's a knockoff but it does the job um so with that let's say these are two different tests that measure two different things. Now, a lot of times when I say, if I take a third of this and a third of that, I have equal portions. But if I take a third of this and a third of that, I don't have equal portions. Clearly, this whoever gets a third of this is getting more than what this person is going to get. And so when we're looking at tests, we want to look at, oh, I got to share my screen. Hold on. Sorry. Share. Go to presentation view. Come on. Okay. When we're looking at tests, we're going to look at a bell curve because majority of tests are rendered with the bell curve in mind. So how do we know what's normal? Everybody that comes in for the most part that's never had any interactive with mental health service, at some point in that intake, they're going to talk about being normal. And I always follow that up with, well, what's that? Uh, because normal for me is not normal for you. I'm pretty sure if we compared everybody's budget in this thing, that's not normal. And so I want you to keep budget in mind too, because that's another picture that helps us really understand what's going on. If we had to compare my bank account to Bill Gates' bank account, we're looking at two different thirds, <laughs> if you get the drift. So when you look at low average and high in some normative assessments that middle up oh, hold on that middle of the line there will represent the middle the average this is what a roundabouts where most people will land so if you looked at a document that had um what was the average iq so average iq starts at 100 for a full, full scale iq when you get out here you get to 120 when you get down here, you get to 85. 
If you're looking for intellectual disability, it's below 70 because that's what the state's cutoff is. So if they're at an 85, they are not getting a waiver for intellectual disabilities because they're not intellectually disabled because the cutoff for intellectual disability is 69. That's just how that works. Now, another measure might have its average score be 130. So if that's the case, if this is the average for IQ, but then I'm using a different measure that has a 130, we need a bigger cup. So you have to look at the size of your cup with each assessment that you go through. And so when we get to the second example of tests, because I only did two today because I didn't want it to be overwhelming. Um, we take it low and light so that we can apply that first, get that under belt. And then if I need to come back and do more and you have specific questions that are arising, you guys can reach out to me and let me know what that is. Um, and we can probably schedule something. So if this is at, if the average is 100, we'll use this. If, if the average is, if it's Bill Gates, 15 million, we need a bigger glass. And so as you go through each test, you need to realign your cup every single time or realign your bank account every single time. Um, once you start doing that, that's functional math. That's how that works. So you can't just take two tests, put them side by side and say, I'm going to do a comparison, but you didn't check the cup size because you're really not comparing anything. You're getting yourself all confused. And, and that happens even sometimes with the seasoned clinician that doesn't administer tests, but just uses the results to plan, um, to talk through and say, hey, this is what your scoring is saying. What are your thoughts about this? Um, and a lot of times what does happen is this isn't necessarily fun work. Um, most people in their master's and undergrad, they get through statistics by the skin of their teeth. And they don't want to go back into it, but really what it does take is a good handle on it in order to be able to effectively plan care in relation to doing adaptive work that is actually speaking to an assessment that was done. And so you got to know what your glass is looking like. You've got to know if your glass is bigger than low. If, if my, my husband drove a Traverse, I drive a little Equinox where he said his tank is low and I said my tank is low. That's two different like budgetary items right there. His tank is low as a eye roll. Oh gosh, <laughs> my tank is low. Oh, I'll just fill up tomorrow. It'll be fine. You know, because of that, what it requires of you. So just like it requires more when it's empty, it also requires more when it's full. And so we make sure we check our glass when we look at each measure and that'll help us through. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second check the questions and bring up the test because I didn't want to embed a Word document into <laughs> the okay so are there limited timelines for readministering psychological testing i know that there's a significant gap commonly one to three years in the educational setting so in an educational setting they do a, a triennial every three years they don't test every three years sometimes mm -hmm. they'll do a triennial based off testing that's already been done oftentimes after a child hits 11 12 unless there's something else that happens majorly they won't administer a psychological again even at additional triennials without someone provoking them to um that's because once you hit around age 11 to 13 things kind of solidify you're not going to magically move from a 85 IQ to 120 that's right. not how that works now within the community setting the testing should be valid um, for an extended period of time. But however, sometimes there are a few exceptions. For instance, one of the main exceptions I have, every kid that tested during COVID that did their testing virtually, <laughs> I am sending them back through testing because you get a different result when they're actually in the room. I hate testing that was done through the computer, through telehealth. I understand we didn't have a choice and it had to be done and we needed the data, but most of that I would see where the kid was dancing in the background the whole time and they just asked me questions. They never interacted with the child. And if the parent is, my arm just fell off with the paper cut, that's going to impact the outcome. So it might not paint a complete picture, especially if I'm seeing this child and working with this child and getting to know this child. And I'm questioning whether they've got the right kid's name on the chart, then we need to have a, a look at that. And so that's one of the exceptions. The other exception is 
if you get educational testing in the educational environment, that testing is specifically looking at how that kid navigates in the school environment, with the exception of the functional IQ, because it's going to give me a good score. But then we might not necessarily plan for things that need to be happening in the home space. And there might be questions that I need to ask, but what the school is looking for is can he, nav he or she navigate our environment? What I'm looking at is developmentally, can we navigate life? And so sometimes I'll call in for a little bit more testing. I might not necessarily need a few full battery. I might need a few measures. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, most insurance companies will only pay for testing every three years. And then sometimes those things have caps. Testing is definitely not free. <laughs> it's not always easily attain attainable. And so that can be a little bit, you know, problematic there. So let me get this show on the road. I got these two examples because that's what I felt like we have time for. And it does appear that that's all we have time for. So I think I estimated appropriately. Um, I titled my clients that I made up. Um, Jane Doe and John Doe. I, I made these up. So these are not, you know, real people. Um, this first test is a test that comes out with the invalid result because I found that for myself when I first entered into understanding testing, I was like, okay, I understood what all that said, but the invalid, what does that mean? That means that if we reduce the stressors in this kid's life, we're going to possibly get a completely different score. So clinically, for me, that's where we need to focus. Let's get you some safety. Let's get you some emotional language awareness, um, insight. Let, let's get you some support. And then in three years, if necessary, we can test you again, or we could just administer like a quick free domain measure, understanding that that test didn't really tell us what was going on. It told us more about what you was feeling that you couldn't voice. Um, so it depends on how you use that information. It does not mean always, especially with children, that this person was lying and we need to punish them. Although sometimes it gets misread by the courts and that's pretty much exactly what I've seen happen. Um, when it comes to substance use, it does mean they're lying or they might not have insight, but they still lying. So it's like, what do we do with that lie? Was it magical thinking? Magical thinking is a kid responding, did you break that? No, because they didn't want to have broken it. It's not because they're lying. They don't want to get in trouble, but they're not trying to get out of trouble. They're wishing that what they said was true because they said it, not because of what has, has happened. And sometimes people get trapped in those spaces, especially when there's trauma or, or abuse. So on this one, Jane was referred, make that nice and big, uh, for testing um, to determine the level of care needed. I should have picked a different birthday. Um, let's do this. Let's make her a little bit older. Um, I mean, a little bit younger. Um, Jane is currently diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, unspecified anxiety disorder, and depression. So we don't always know where these um, diagnoses came about. Sometimes they're reported. Sometimes they're already of record because a practitioner has done them. But we also know that once testing is completed, it's either going to confirm or deny these diagnoses. If you see the letters R slash O, that's rule out. That means they, do, they may or may not have that diagnosis diagnosis, which means that part of testing is to try to tease that out and understand whether or not that's in existence. Um, she was scheduled for the MMPI and, and then the MACI. And then she has an unusually large number and range of problematic thoughts, feelings, and behaviors compared to most other 13 to 18 year olds in the clinical setting. Her over report was not intended to deceive, this is indicative of a cry for help. So based on how they lie, the measures will tell you what kind of lie it was. Was it they leaving stuff out? They're adding stuff in, they're making stuff smaller, they're making stuff bigger. And then the MFPI will tell them within her over report, she didn't fall into the range of being personality disordered. She fell into the range of the sky is falling. So she chicken little within the measures of testing. And it tells you that it makes it very simple. So people think that, oh, that was the assessor's um, impression. No, 
that was the test impression, if that makes sense. Um, so keeping that in mind. And then it tell and the way that the assessor is telling you that it wasn't their idea that this person was lying for kicks is only one percent of the Mackey is a normative sample to give that much of a number. So it's telling you statistically it's very improbable that she's telling the truth, which puts her in the cry for help phase. Does that help so far? Everybody understand? Um, several possible explanations of this extremely high score are listed below. Now, thanks to the advent of computers, a lot of these tests when they're entered in, it generates a probability list of these things. And the tester now has to go through and look at that list and based off of what the person reported in a clinical interview and click through, it could be all of these, but it, they'll click through what it more probably is based off of what they were told. So they're also, now there's the art form painting that picture. Um, Let's see. She has a large number of problematic thoughts, feelings, behaviors compared to most other kids this age seen in clinical study, set, settings. And then the overreport was not intended to deceive. It was a cry for help. And she deliberately faked unfavorable responses when completing the inventory, faking bad. It's possibly motivated by a perception on part of whether accurate or not. And then may have believed that the responses would increase the likelihood of the desired outcome. So maybe this is a kid that gets ignored a lot and they've been crying for help and they don't want this test to reflect that they don't need help. They can't afford for that to happen. And so they go into a hyperdrive of reporting because they want you to know I need help. But that's faking bad because while you might need help, nobody needs as much help as you indicated because only 1% would give that response. So you lied. Not saying you don't need help, but you didn't tell the truth and now we don't know how much help you need. Does that make sense? Okay, so it might reflect the unwillingness to cooperate because some kids will just say everything's bad and awful. You know it is, I hate it here. I don't wanna be in foster care. Just put me in an apartment and leave me to my own. I'm almost grown anyway, I'm fine. That that can also be a reason why. And maybe they gave that in the clinical interview. I can't wait to get out of my mother's house. I hate it there. Well, yeah, we got to click that and we check the boxes for the information we have. So anything they check these boxes for, they definitely have receipts based on clinical interview. Things that aren't always included is behavioral observations, because we also understand that we're getting a snapshot. We're getting an hour of time here and there of this person when they might be a different way somewhere else. But we take that hour and we take that into consideration and that helps us inform because we have to use the information at hand to make diagnostics. Um, now, that is that front part. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to go straight into two. And this is where it gets interesting. Okay. Now, let's go to John Joseph, though. I thought I went John, but I said, no, I'll do Joseph. And I picked the J's because there's a lot of J's in my family. So playing around there. Okay. So this is a whisk. Um, I picked this one because this is one I use a lot. And what I did was I basically took what you normally see in a psychological because I, when this test is administered, they usually always include this chart and you guys will see this. Now, if you remember, we're looking, it's got that W, so it's an intelligence test. And based on this age, it'll tell you which one was administered. Okay, everybody with me so far. Now, the first thing we need to do is not get lost in the sauce. We are going to check our size of cup. So I come over here and I look at the confidence level and it's kind of giving me these numbers. And these numbers um, tell me where things fall within the bell curve. So if I were to plug these numbers into the bell curve, it's gonna tell me what's going on. So high average, we are somewhere over here. We're not in the this space, but we over here somewhere. Then we come back to the assessment and down here, low average, 79 to 94. We still, oh shoot, I clicked something wrong, but it opened somewhere else, so it's fine. We're low average, we're still in this spot, we're still okay, but we've fallen over here. So this is telling me we've got some scatter in our development. Most of us are walking around scattering in our development. If we think back to what we were told in childhood, some of us talked, 
before we walked and some of us walked before we talked because what development is, is a stair step. One area develops, it gets its footing and then the other area picks up. My mom said I was talking in the blanket. No figure, you became a therapist. So <laughs> that's how that works. So those are sometimes the cognitions, the motivations, different things like that. So coming back over here. And so we know where we are. But if we want to cheat and just cut the numbers out, I just need to know what's going on. What I do, forget all of that. I look over here, high average, high average, okay? I like to do strength-based work. So I'll get some strength-based goals there to help the client get comfortable with me. And because I they have to be comfortable with me if we're going to go in and do harder work. Then once we get to the hard, that, that happening, ooh, working memory, okay. So when I do that first challenge, I have seven versions of memory in my office. We're going to play memory. We're going to see what that work in memory looking like and how weak it is. And once you're not anxious, let's see how you perform. Because on testing day, the tests even have a little bit of curve in there because they understand that you're being tested. So you're going to be anxious. That comes with that. So when they come in with me and they come in by session three or four, because kids are there, I call it their BS detectors. They're pretty good. They'll know whether they can deal with me or not or whether they're done with me. I tell them, give me four sessions before you fire me. If you don't want me, I'll help you find someone else. I promise. Um, and so, but by that time, we're like, okay, we're working together. You stuck with me. I'm stuck with you. Let's love it here. So I want you to do something hard. And I usually prep them for it the week before. And then they come in and we start working, working memory. Processing speed. Mm, how fast you moving and making those decisions? These two things right here, are getting in the way of these things. Um, a client that presents this way with good strategies and interventions, we can work on building this up because once we build this up, this is only gonna go up higher because your strengths get better when you address your weaknesses, but you gotta address the strengths first in treatment. And then the full scale IQ, this is the first thing I look at. We know that in this test, instead of 100 being the farthest over, it's 110. And then to 99, that's the confidence level. That that's the that's an average range. Their full scale IQ is a 79 and a 75. No, that's the summer score. It's composite score. Percentile rank is 63. So they're between a 99 and 110. So what the assessor would do between the 99 and 110 is add those two numbers, get the average, and then somewhere in the assessment piece, the part that looks like this up here, it'll mention what that full scale IQ is, and that's the average of those two numbers. So for reference points, when you're reading through the, I call it the goobity gock that comes before the numbers, you'll see instead of them writing verbal comprehensions, visual, spatial, they'll say the VCI, the VSI, the FRI, the W, you know, when you see all of that, this is your key. It tells you what those things mean and what was being looked at and where the deficits are. So sometimes when I first started, I would sit, print the psychological off because you can't really, and I started back when we were still using paper chart. So I make a copy of it, I get a pencil and I sit down and I'd have my key next to the test and I would make notes of where their deficits were so that I could make sure I understand it. Over time, you get better at it with practice. Some of our practices will come faster depending on how much exposure we have to it. I've had an inordinate amount of exposure to this. That's why I understand it's a, it's like who rides a bike every day? That person is doing one thing, but if somebody like is riding toward their friends, they're going to ride differently, you know? So there's always wiggle room in how we improve on these things. You kind of have to reach for it in order to get it. So this is all that I prepared today. Sorry if I overwhelmed you guys. But does this help? Okay. Now I guess we can go straight to questions or if there's no more questions, we can done. It's up to you guys. You've got me for another 20 or so minutes. I see a hand up. I thought I saw a hand. Sarah Glass or... You may have to unmute Sarah. And if you're not comfortable talking, throw it in the chat. I get it. Okay, go back to the reading test again. Oh, wait, hold on. So for the IQ, how does that work again? Okay. Yeah, the 
Yeah, can yeah, can you go back to the reading of the test again? Okay. Hold on, let me do this. Cause this might help. And um, can you can you tell us a little more about some of the other numbers like um like the the low ones? Um Okay. So if this person right here with the processing speed being extremely low, they are no longer in the average range. They are now in the red category of the deficit in that area of their development. Meaning if we're doing like this kid for me, I'm like, oh, ADHD. Okay. Like it's clear to me because I look at these a lot. That means that they're very capable because very high range, high range, very high. But if they're going to sit in a class in, let's say, Joseph is in middle school and take a word problems test, that he is going to struggle. He's going to need some accommodations that I'm going to be recommending when I speak with his parents about how to advocate for maybe an IEP with the OHI impairment to address the ADHD and how it's impacting learning because that's in that extremely low range. The reason why I want this kid supported even though they have a normative IQ is because this is getting in the way of them being able to express their IQ and it's actually bringing their score overall down. And if we have things that maybe even address maybe some of the anxiety that they have with the working memory and processing speed, then we should get better results with their ability to perform. Um, we also want accommodations, like more time on tests because processing speed is very low. We need help with that. So everybody else get 30 minutes, he gets an hour. Um, and that way he could be able to really demonstrate what he's capable of doing. Now, over time in treatment, we're gonna work on some strategies of really pressuring and treating it like it's a bicycle and we're learning how to ride it faster, if that makes sense. But mm -hmm. when you see low, it's easy to simplify and say, if it's low, there's a deficit. If it's extremely low, there's a major concern. If it's average, we're good. We're just like everybody else. If we're in the low average, that's kind of like a warning. If your processing speed is bad, your working memory is going to be affected by it. You don't get to be bad at one thing. You get to be bad at more than one thing. It's kind of like if I'm bad at keeping track of how much money I have in the bank, then the likelihood of me overdrafting is going to be higher than average, which is going to be another bad. Because there's consequences to having weaknesses. And so, so that what, working... Hmm? So, so working memory is what you can keep in your mind at the same time and work on? Yes. That's mm -hmm. information that's accessible to you right now. His mm -hmm. brain, or yeah, Joseph's brain, I said, or her, is with the processing speed being low, they have a hard time understanding what they need to pick up. Because they don't know what to pick up, if I didn't pick up the right things, I don't have it to pull from the recall. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to teach problem solving to this kid. I'm going to teach how to evaluatively look at a, a situation and start to really not try to take in everything in a room. Another space this exists is in the realm of trauma. Those kids have a lot of awareness of what's going on around them, but n literally no awareness of what's happening inside because they're in fight flight mode they're trying to stay safe so mm -hmm. I have to teach them okay let's get you to calm down first let's get you some anchoring let's get some sensory stuff going on here so you can get yourself feeling safe and once you're safe uh, I have one little fella he says because I have them stay statements and then I teach them what big words mean because that kind of helps because I'm trying to give them the vocabulary to be able to articulate. He said, I can do hard things. I can do complicated things, you know, and once they get to that space, you'll see that processing speed picking up. Um, and then I teach parents how to play with their children to help them with naturally kind of giving them opportunities and safer environments to curb some of this, if that makes sense. Um, I see. So how do you... hmm? Just a, yeah. So how do you know if it's ADHD causing it or if it's? That's um, where I'm going to be relying on other tests. Work on them. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. other okay. tests are going to tell okay. me and tease out between mm -hmm. that anxiety structure getting in the way versus that executive functioning. Um, mm -hmm. ADHD, the three pillars. I'm looking for your motivation skills, your um, organization, and your executive functioning. Um, and then you can't have both. 
I see that all the time too. But whatever I see, I treat. So, but first I'm going to bring down the anxiety because that's the low hanging fruit. Once I bring down the anxiety, then you can hear me and I can teach you how to do the other stuff. But a lot mm -hmm. of that is based on relational gaining of trust. So I'm going to always start at where they are high. If I start mm -hmm. off where you're high and get you feeling like you got this and then I let you make a little bit of mistake, but I'm an encourager, you're going to work for me because kids want to be successful even if it's just an hour a week with me. And then my hope is helping the people around them facilitate structures where they can lead their success one into other spaces. And then now we're at school making friends. We have autism, we're socially awkward, but that social stuff you taught me works. And now I have a friend that I play with on the slide and, or I had a birthday party and it wasn't my sister's friends. I got to invite someone, you know, those types of things are what we're looking for treatment wise. Can we change your disorder? No, but we can work around it. That's why people that can't walk use wheelchairs. Let's work around whatever the disability is to get you at least as close to an even playing field as everyone else with as little, you know, obstruction as possible. That's always the goal. All right. So Barbara. that, so that, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. Just to follow up with that. So that tells us how, how the teacher, how the counselor would interpret this and what they would do with it. Can you give us more, uh, more, information about how a CASA would use it. Okay. So how I've and, seen and, 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 okay. and one other question. How and where can we find a definition of all these things like what it is actually measuring, like visual, Ooh, spatial, I didn't include that. Visual. Okay. For, um, for each I'm I'm assuming that for every <laughs> single test yeah. you showed us there's different terminologies, right? There so is find red terminologies. Um, there is terminology for every single test and all the things. Sometimes or most often in tests, you'll see a brief explanation of what things are within the test itself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so if that doesn't um, answer it, a lot of times you can reach back out to the psychologist. Um, you can go into, I call it the internet psych sphere, not necessarily Google, because people like to play with things like Wikipedia, which is not peer reviewed. So make sure you source where your sites are coming from, right. but you yeah. can Google it and make sure you're looking at something that's clinically, I look for .gov <laughs> primarily mm -hmm. because we have a whole body of people that we pay to keep on top of these things and tell us what's within the normative range, because mm -hmm. what's normative now is definitely not what's normative 30 years ago because we're at a 30 year deficit in reading abilities that's going to impact how we look at that type of a testing as far as what the education system is looking like so yeah what's the difference like, and sophia and we've got um barbara roth who's been waiting to ask oh. the question as well okay. okay sorry i'm uh i'm taking up too much of your time go ahead go ahead with the others are you ready or for me, yeah. Barbara? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm used to looking at um, psychologicals as far as children and education go. Um, but I have a question. Um, can you please like give us some things that sh we should be concerned about in an adult? Like a lot of our parents or caregivers get a psychosocial evaluation. Can you give us some things that we should be looked at, looking at that are concerns? Um, because we have to make recommendations and like for therapy, for family preservation, the parent coaching and things like that. I mean, we've okay. got to we've got to look at a psychological and make recommendations out of our concerns looking at a psychological. Okay. So when you're looking at a psychological and you're looking at your concerns that are coming out of the psychological, again, you're going to come to the same spaces. Go to the charts, look for the highs, look for the lows. When you see a low, what often happens is this, because it's harder to come up with those recommendations outside of social services. Um, and the hard part with the adults, the parents that go through the programs, when they come for the results, they don't often come. The results, if I'm not mistaken, are usually just forwarded straight on the DSS. Yeah. And so when you guys are sitting down with DSS, are you always sitting down with DSS and the client that was tested? No, we're not. We just get a report from and we share it. I mean, it's shared with DSS and with CASA. Okay. We get a report. We look at it, read it. We see concerns that are there, some highs, some lows. It gives like with the um the parenting inventory, like things like that. What are some 
red flags that we should be looking for anything there. that looks at just low is a, a little bit of a red flag that any low should be addressed that can be addressed if they say something to the effect of and i i get some like this sometimes when they get their heads tied up and they don't they're not sure what to do um i've had where dss will refer to our parenting program right. and i'll get the assessment and i'll look at the assessment and for me it clearly states that the assessor said that this mom doesn't have capacity right maybe mom is severely intellectually disabled and unfortunately sometimes capacity for parenting is something that you can't rehabilitate you can't teach right. my six-year-old how to parent he needs to be parented and so she has the cognitive ability of a six-year-old we can't functionally rehabilitate that right the only way that that parent would be parenting is with functional support meaning they must always be living with someone as a condition and that person that they're living with has more authority in that child's life than they do so essentially you're not able to raise your child right and so if you don't have that support system there um what i would always recommend but i know that in this environment is hard is that the parents go to therapy the problem is there's not enough of us out here that's well, true and seeing someone once a month for the type of problems that gets your child removed from a, a home is laughable considering what needs to happen you need intensive therapy so they need an intensive program when they do our program is three three is the minimum of hours and you don't start out there you start out closer to 10 um because we've got to fix this it's not a little broke it's dysfunctional that means it's broke enough to get a diagnosis right. um and have a treatment plan and goals out objectives and outcomes a lot of times it's not a bad idea to have the CASA worker go with the parent to an initial intake make sure the data is provided and then make the therapist a little uncomfortable by asking them to look at this assessment you see these highs and lows how do we adaptively address this like what do we do I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because I there is like there was I did talk to a therapist and he did not know the mom's ability. I mean he right. didn't know, he had no idea. Right. And that's sometimes it's a lack of information, sometimes it's laziness, sometimes it's prioritization of different aspects of your work depending upon where you're working at what they expect of you. I work at advanced psychotherapeutic for neuroplastic research and development. It is expected that I understand right. what this is and what well, it means. And, and I think that he, and I gave him the grace in that he did not know the, all the, no one was honest with him. So about what right. was going on. So, you know, he was surprised. So. And that's also happening more because even though everything is shared with DSS and CASA workers, it used to be, if you talked to me eight years ago, if I was getting a new client from DSS, DSS would send me everything and I would have everything oh, before the yeah. intake. Now we have offices with literally three people doing the job right. of 20. And so things are getting dropped, mm -hmm. not by negligence, but you're gonna not just drop some babies you're gonna kill a few it's when, like you're always it's like you're always in triage like which is first which is more right explore. you're in the emergency yeah. room yeah. you can't get to the operating room with right. numbers like that and so because right. of that i think the castle workers if they help with that responsibility of making sure records get where they can make because it doesn't do anybody any good to have someone go through testing and nobody ever look at it right it doesn't even if it's an established client, if I get to send them the testing and I don't look at it, that's negligence. <laughs> so we can't we can't be doing that. And I understand we're all drowning, but we've got to make sure that we handle what's in our care before we take on more water. And unfortunately, the system, we need more bodies. We need more people. The people that left for other waters during the pandemic, we need them to come back. So they're going to have to I guess pay them more. I don't know, you know, give them better self-care. It's a bigger systemic problem. And so it does tend to have an impact. Thank you, Sophia. Mm -hmm. uh, let me stop sharing this so I can see the chat box. 
Can we go back to the reading? That was you. All right. After you answer this question, we have others that want to ask. Okay. Three to 10 hours of therapy needed per week or month initially. That's evaluated. We use the FAM 3. Um, it has 10 different areas that I teach from. And we start off with psychoeducation. Uh, we talk about what it is, just like I just kind of did a little bit of psychoeducation about the measures testing. And then we start meeting with the coach and planning how we're going to implement that strategy. And then we get feedback for how it worked, didn't work, how it fell apart. What were some new problems? Because, you know, when we do problem solving, I use the five finger approach. What's your problem? How do you feel about it? What are your options? What's the best one? And then usually with kids, I say, so how did it go? With adults, I say, okay, what's your new problem? <laughs> because that's how life works. If you take the money for the light bill and you pay for the car repair, okay, let's see. Our new problem is what are we going to do about lights? So, and getting them into that systemic pattern of problem solving rather than circling the drain is the way that we're trying to go with the entire program. Then as we go through the 10 areas, every three to four areas, because we cluster them together in the way that they fit, we retest that, that area of the FAM3 to see if that score is coming up. If that score is going down, then that's a parent that's telling me they're discouraged with parenting, they're they're not able to do it. And we start having really honest conversations. I go over the results with them very forthwith. We're not hiding this information. Um, I'm all about having uncomfortable conversations is what I do for a living. Like, hey, you're not doing better. You're doing worse. So tell me, where are you getting stuck? Let's see if we can, you know, keep you from getting bogged down. It's like a person that's going to see a trainer. If they're seeing a trainer at the gym, they're meeting, talking about diet, and then you go for a weigh-in and you weigh more and it's not muscle, we need to have a conversation, you know, about what do we need to adjust? What do we need to augment? What's happening? Your stress levels are going up. Tell me about that. How are you prioritizing things? Because we have to get through this. This isn't going to last forever, but it's going to last for a while. And so some families, I think a minimum of maybe four or five hours, a maximum of 10. It depends on how dysfunctional. And then there's intermittent conversations and contact communications letters and things like that going to DSS to let them know this is how they're doing. So as they approach those court dates, you get additional information that will provide, okay, so this was an area of deficit that was pointed out in that assessment, Your Honor. These are the functional things that mom has done to address that area. And this is how much her score has changed in that area. And we're still continuing with the program. She's at, you've got data. It's not about your opinion. It's not about how you feel. And then you know how sometimes when the rights are gonna be terminated, they're circling that drain for a whole year, damaging that poor child. Um, your honor, mom was given this, 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 because we, I say, document everything. They didn't show up. Oh, her ear hurting again. Okay, so on September 7th, her issue was her ear. On September 8th, it was her car. On the 9th, her baby daddy. On the, you know, it's just, so then you get that picture of this is what's really going on on a day-to-day with this person's life. And this is how they're not managing what we've given them to manage. And then this is how the coach tried to work with them and they've got to want to work harder than anybody that's working for them will if they're going to get the results that they meet out in the end. So that's how our program was titrated. Um, I actually co-authored it <laughs> with a couple of PhDs that knew more about testing than I do, but I'm looking at evidence-based things, best practices with CBT and a few other modalities blended in to get something that either you're going to shape up or you're going to ship out. But we're going to give you everything you need to be potentially successful as long as you do the work. And that's how that program is, is administered. And we use testing throughout it to keep checking ourselves rather than it just being on, oh, I feel like she can do it. It doesn't matter how I feel. The evidence of the test says that she can do it. I might not like her, but she's doing the work, you know, that th those sort of things. And so that helps to remove that that power from us and put it back on the client to do what they need to do. And then after they're joined together, the social workers can mandate that she continue integrated work where she and the child are working on their relationships and we can follow that up with additional treatment as well. Let's see. Anyone else have any questions? Well, if not, then we are coming up to our, um, we've got like two or three minutes left, of course, of this session. But um, of course, Sophia, thank you so much for walking us through 
um, a good portion of like majority of the common tests that we've seen, you know, come across a psyche vial or, you know, we will see, you know, in the future. Um, we have one final question from Marilyn. Um, Marilyn, you have to unmute. I think that's clapping. Oh, okay. That's, that <laughs> yeah. works. But, you know, the little hands, they always, oh, they yeah. always look, look different. Uh, also, also, are we going to get the slides? Are we going to get access to the, to the slides? I've already sent them to Ms. Carter and she can forward it on. Yes. Now exactly. you won't get the examples or uh, unless she shares them because, well, I don't mind if you share it all. It's fine. But those examples yeah. are not like concrete. <laughs> Those right. examples just represent what you should be looking for and what should be looking at. Don't get stuck by the numbers. Um, if you run across a term and you're like, what in the world is this? I Googled it. I still don't know what it is. My email is at the end of the PowerPoint. I say, give me to the following Friday. If you send it on a Friday, I might not get to you to the following Friday, but I do respond. At least I try to. Sometimes I don't hit send. Ms. Carter knows about that. <laughs> so there's that. Um, yeah, so everyone will be provided, you know, um, with the with the slideshow, of course, following after this training. So just check your emails, as well as there's a few attendees that I don't have a name with. Um, one of them is just listed as a phone number. So if everybody could just put your name in the group chat, so that way I can record your attendance, and that way you get credit. Um, you know, for attending, of course, this evening, that would be super helpful. Um, Sophia, Deborah asked, are you taking new clients? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I have a wait list that got to the point where it was almost a year long. If you look behind my moniker, I just got my S credential today. Um, so I've hired a doctoral student that is taking clients under me. I'm teaching her as she goes how I do what I do. Um, she is more fluid at testing than I am, and I'm more fluid at um, intervention as she and we put our heads together and we make magic happen. Um, she is slowly taking some clients. I only have her till May, though, and I do plan to interview more um, residents and interns to help pick some things up because um, I don't have capacity <laughs> to take any more clients. Um, I had already preemptively scheduled to be off today. That was the only way I was able to do this. Otherwise, I normally would still be working. Um, so I'm sorry. I don't have openings. I do have a wait list. And we well, do take Medicaid. I was supposed to say, and they do take Medicaid. So if you all are, you know, active on your cases and parents are, you know, needing a psych eval, you know, you might can tell the DSS worker, hey, there's a place in Lynchburg, advanced psychotherapeutics that accepts Medicaid, you know, um, try to be an most advocate forms. there. Most forms. Yeah. Yes, yes, most forms. All. There's there's different forms of Medicaid, of course, now. But um, Sophia, thank you so, so much for taking thank the you. time out your busy schedule just to help walk us through for a better understanding. We greatly appreciate it and hope to work with you again in the future. Okay. Thank you guys for having me. You guys have a, a blessed one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you too. All right. And you all are all free to go. Again, um, I see most of you have put your names in the chat, so I should be able to have everyone's attendance to be able to make sure that you're getting credit for attending. And thanks for so much for spending your even with us. I really appreciate it. And until next time. There's a... Thank you.